continue our reading commentary through the prophet Ezekiel. With that, if you'll turn there with me, we introduced this last time, Ezekiel 1, verses 1 to 9, seeing this vision, or if you will, a dream that was given to Ezekiel, whereby God was pleased to reveal himself to him. He was part of the second exile out of Israel by Nebuchadnezzar before he came down the third time and as the Lord purposed destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple because of the idolatry of Judah. And yet God preserved a remnant. Why? Because all the way back there David the Lord promised him that there would be a seed that would be raised up from him to sit on the throne. That would be Christ. Well, David was of the tribe of Judah. And so even though God took the tribe into exile, he preserved that remnant just like he does today. There's a remnant, Paul said, according to the election of grace irrespective of those that God does condemn, there's that people, that race that he has preserved and given to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's continue reading here, beginning with verse 10, and I'll attempt to get down to verse 28 if the Lord so directs. If not, we'll just draw a line and come back to it. But what we're seeing here is a vision that was given to Ezekiel, and when I think of how people describe today their supposed visions of God, that there was a warm light and a warm feeling and a bright light, and they just felt like they were being pulled toward that light. How different this vision here that we see with, with regard to Ezekiel where it says there, we saw last time in verse 4, he saw a whirlwind come out of the north, a great cloud of fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Well, this is a picture of God himself exercising his authority in every one of those things, whether it's the whirlwind or a great cloud or the fire, the brightness those are all descriptions of God in his majesty and his infiniteness. And this is the very description that you read here that is similar to what John saw of Christ. So what we read here with regard to how God revealed himself to Ezekiel is exactly how he revealed himself to John because I believe this is none other than a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came to this earth, that wasn't his beginning. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we have a description here of the Lord Jesus Christ, who we read in Hebrews, he's the visible image of the invisible God. So here's where God was pleased to reveal himself to Ezekiel. And then we saw last time these four living creatures in verse 5, and, and uh, this was their appearance. It says they had a likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet. So out of, because it says there, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of these four living creatures. This is a description of the cherubim. These angels that minister around the throne and like Isaiah said night and day they're crying holy 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 is the Lord you would that people today would hear that of what the angels describe concerning God because people today they feel like they've had a view of God and they say God's love well you don't find the angels crying love 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 no, holy, holy, holy. And so that begs the question for any one of us, how can I ever hope to see God apart from his holiness being satisfied? Well, 
that's the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of this is given as a view of, of the very presence of God, whereby these, what it says their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. You think about a calf's foot, it can walk on anything, go anywhere. It doesn't have to have smooth territory. They can even climb up sides of hills if they need to, such as the feet that they're given. So I believe this is a description here even of these cherubim. There's nothing that can hinder where they go to accomplish why God has sent them. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. We've got polish to make brass look bright. And before ceremonies and other things, you get out the brass cleaner and get everything just right. That's the picture here of burnished brass, the brightness with which these present themselves. And it says they had hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. Whenever God sent his angels to reveal them unto men, they always appeared as men. I know in this uh, culture today, people don't like that. They want to take away all gender in the Bible, and sadly, there are some that are doing that. They don't even want God to be referred to as he. But this is how God pictures himself. And not only is Christ represented as a man who came in this flesh to redeem sinners, but the angels. I don't read anywhere in scripture where there was ever a female angel that God sent just to make sure we keep everything equal. Now, God is God, and there's a reason he's done this. In this scripture, presented as a man, bringing a message to men, it depicts strength. That's how this is written. And their, their wings were joined one to another. That talks about the unity even among the cherubim. They're not fighting each other. These are the elect angels that God has preserved, and they have one mission, one purpose, and that is to glorify their creator, God. So they turned not when they went, and they went everyone straight forward. So that brings us up a little bit about what we saw last time. Now, verse 10, we get in a little deeper here, because I know everybody was asking, well, what about these four faces? I love scripture, because if you just read far enough, it gives the answer. It's the Lord's purpose to give an answer. There's some things he has not revealed, but this he has. Notice here in verse 10, as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. So if you're an artist to sit down and kind of picture this, you might look at it and think, well, this looks like a monster. But again, it's a vision, it's allegoric, and it's to teach us something about these angels. And we read on all the way down to verse 14. Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went everyone straight forward, whether the spirit was to go. I think here the translators could very well have put spirit in capital S. Because these are directed by none other than the spirit of God himself. And they went whither the spirit was to go. They went and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright and out of the fire went forth lightning. Everything again we see about these ministering angels that night and day minister before God who is a consuming fire they reflect that in their being. When you think about them being in the presence of God and his holiness, and they cry night and day, holy, holy, holy. But Job said, even there, because these are angels that never fell. 
And Job said that even their brightness cannot compare. It pales compared to the holiness of God himself. And yet we see a small reflection here in their appearance when it speaks of lamps, of coals of fire. These are representatives of God and his person. Now there are all kinds of commentaries out there about these four creatures. I believe the most significant reason why it mentions here, first of all, the face of a man and their faces in verse 10, face of a lion, secondly, thirdly, of an ox, and then fourthly, the face of an eagle. We don't have time to go back and study all this because this is a reading commentary, but each one of these represents four of the ensigns of some of the key tribes of Israel that were camped on the four corners of the tabernacle in the Old Testament. In other words, we might call these mascots, but each tribe had an emblem that represented that tribe. And we know that, for example, Judah, what was the standard for Judah? A lion, <laughs> the lion of Judah. What was the emblem, ensign of Reuben? Because these were all around the tabernacle. This is where they would have been encamped. And remember, the Lord has just taken these tribes into captivity. The northern tribes, Reuben amongst them, Dan went, only Judah remained, and yet here we see these four faces. It's a reminder that God is God, and even though these tribes had disappeared, he's still the God of his people. So you had Reuben that represented a man, you've got Dan that represented the eagle. And Ephraim represented an ox. Like I said, we don't have time to go back and look at that, but you can study that on your own if you will. I believe that's the clearest explanation as to why we have these four beings that are mentioned here that, the, that represent these, these angels. Now, some think it's just another way of saying that, and I don't have a problem with that either, that it represents these angels having complete authority, the authority of God over all his creation, beginning with man. Man's mentioned first because even as in the garden, the Lord placed Adam there to, what, govern the earth, even though he fell. And then the eagle, you got each one of the kingdoms, whether it's man, whether it's the fowl, you got the eagle. Whether you've got the ox representing more domestic type animals, and then you got the lion among the wild beasts. It's another way of saying that nothing lives or moves or has its being apart from what God has directed even these angels over all that takes place. So either way, I can see a lesson in how the Lord had revealed himself through these to Ezekiel. So let's pick up with verse 15 now. Now, you can imagine Ezekiel seeing these things. We have the benefit now of the rest of scriptures, but here he is, as we saw already along the river Kabar, reflecting upon everything that's taken place. This was the 30th, his 30th year which was the year that a priest entered into the priesthood, yet he had no temple. And yet he was still God's priest. As we go on, we're going to see him again as a type of Christ, God's priest. But here he is reflecting in verse 15, Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. We've all heard that little spiritual Ezekiel had a wheel well that's this is where it's 
drawn from. A lot of people sing about it but have no clue what it means. We're going to find out what it means. What was this wheel now? We've seen these angels. We've seen the four faces. Now this wheel. And it says the appearance of the wheels. So behold one wheel. And yet wheels within a wheel. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of burl. And they four had one likeness. And their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. Talking about the wheels. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful. So we're not talking about a man-made wheel here. And it says their rings were full of eyes round about them four. Number four here keeps appearing. I believe it's because it covers north, south, east, and west. You only have four directions you can go, really. You can go maybe northeast, but it's still north, south, east, or west. And that's the direction of this wheel. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. I believe this is a picture of God's sovereign providence in this world. We don't see how he employs angels to accomplish his purpose and will, but they're active. We just don't see them. It could be in the wind. It's, it could be in judgments. These are things that God sends forth his angels to accomplish his purpose. But notice here when it says the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. This wheel represents God's sovereign providence, again, over all things, and it directs his cherubim, and who knows how many. People always try to figure out, well, how many are there? It's as many as the Lord has purpose. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, Again, I, I, I believe that could be, should be capital S there. Whether so the spirit was to go, they went. Now, neither was their spirit to go. So wherever the spirit went, but they weren't freewheeling here, literally. They were being directed by the spirit of God. And the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. There it is again, the capital S. Just like back there in the creation of the world, the spirit hovered over the creation when everything was still without, for, without form and void. The spirit is active in directing all things to the glory and honor of God. And it says, when those went, these went, and when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. That means that God animates all things by his spirit. Now again, if you were trying to depict this as an artist would, what these wheels would have looked like, and there's some that have had, sat down and said, let me figure this out like an engineer, these wheels and all this stuff. Well, have at it, but the scriptures don't give us any design. What they do is give us what they mean and what they indicate. And uh, it's like a wheel with a ball bearing in there, or wheels within a wheel. We've got some wheels that way. Wheels turning within a wheel, but the overall outer wheel is being driven by, it says here, the spirit of the living creature that was in the wheels. That means there's not one thing that takes place but what God has ordained it. That's why I say this is a picture of God in his providence. To such a degree that we never have to wonder, no matter what takes place, wind, storm, rain, lightning, it's God that's directing it. But today people don't want to acknowledge God. When you turn on your TV and they give the weather report, what are they talking about? Mother Nature. They'd rather deal with Mother Nature. Oh, Mother Nature, you don't want to get her upset. Or Mother Earth. That's all idolatry and it's paganism. And it's right here in our country. No, it's God. I, I wonder how long a weather person would keep his job if every time he 
stood up to give the weather and said, well, let's see what God has done today. Well, he sent a flood over here, flooded out this whole place. They don't got any running water. He sent a storm down here and it wiped out tens of hundreds of people. How long do you think? Boy, the phones would be ringing off the wall. But you know what? That's the truth. That's why I could never be the weatherman. <laughs> They'd fire me on the spot. But that's what we're reading here. This is God's providence. And so it says there in verse 22, again, the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above and under the firmament were their wings straight. When it talks about the firmament, it's talking about the heavens. God's not just the God of this earth, but the heavens. And these flying creatures, his cherubim, accomplishing his will. Under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other, every one had two, which covered on his side, and every one had two, which covered on that side their bodies. You know, we get impressed when we see a military parade, don't we? Everybody lined up and just walking in step, and you look at that, and you think, wow, that's, that's beautiful to see. That's what we're seeing here with these angels, each one in lock step. No missteps. It says, verse 24, when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters. And what does it say? As the voice of the Almighty. The voice of speech as the noise of an host when they stood lay, they let down their wings how could this have been an encouragement to ezekiel here he is isolated taken out of the land he wasn't targeted in this judgment but he was taken out through the judgment and here here was god now preserving him along the river and now god appears in this vision for his encouragement we're not to expect these sorts of dreams and visions today because we have the word. But I believe we ought to be, by his grace, just as overwhelmed at the view of God and his sovereignty and his will and how he directs all things just by reading this scripture so that we know it, it could be the dark of the night when we feel isolated and all alone. And yet we know God is directing in all things. It says there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. When you think about thunder, think of the voice of God. That's how scriptures describe it. Some people get afraid in a storm. I'm just the opposite. I love a good storm because I know it's the voice of God. That lightning, when God sends it forth, strikes where it does. My granddad always said, if you can see the lightning, you don't have anything to worry about. And that's true. If God had intended to take, take me out with lightning, one time it hit the tree I was climbing, and boy, I was on my back and didn't know what way was up for a while, but the Lord spared me. But even that, I look back on and think the Lord directed that for that time to teach that little boy something of his power. Could he have taken me out? He could have, but then again, he couldn't have because he purposed that I live exactly to this day. So you see in verse 26, above the firmament that was over their heads. This is just to show us that we're not to be enthralled with the angels. That became an issue over time, even down in the New Testament, Hebrews 1, where they were warned not to worship the angels. Here it's describing that over these angels, as majestic as they are, don't get too curious about the angels because there's one overall above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of what? Of a man above upon it. Who's that man? That's Christ. He had not yet come in the flesh, but he was that appointed man into whose hands God the Father had given all authority. And I saw as the color of amber, the appearance of fire round about within it. From the appearance of his loins, even upward, and from the appearance of his loins, even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, 
and it had brightness round about. Sounds just like what we read in Hebrews. Sounds just like what we read in Revelation concerning Christ. He is God. If he's on that throne, he's God. And the appearance, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, why did the Lord give that rainbow? To show his mercy. That never again would he destroy this earth with a flood of water. It would be with fire at the end of time, but every time you see that rainbow, that's a symbol of God's mercy. Sadly, it's been hijacked today by pride people, the rainbow colors, but we need to grab it back and say, no, that has to do not with man, but with Christ himself, with God. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Who is the glory of the Lord? None other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And when I saw it, see, this is what many haven't seen. They, they read this and they think, well, this is interesting. But here it is. When I saw it, Ezekiel says what? I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. To me, that's what I listen for when people start talking to me about having seen God or experienced him. And first of all, well, is it in the word? That you've seen him and heard him because that's what he's given is his word but secondly how are you describing him we don't boastfully stand before him and said i had a vision of the lord no nope. any that have in scripture that have ever met god and here it would be through the mediator of the lord jesus christ it's caused them to bow fall flat on their face who am i that he should consider such as i am Gracious Father, I thank you for this word. We look forward to continuing to read and understand something of your glory in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that indeed we would be brought to bow, and that we would be able by your grace to hear your voice, not an audible voice, but through your word, even as we study in this hour. I give you the praise and honor and glory in Christ's precious name. Amen.